What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. And today, we got something special for y'all because we did our very first live event, No Labels Necessary Live AKA 90 Day Blueprint Live, me, Ja'Cory, J.R. McKee. We had to meet y'all in person. You know what I mean? Shake hands. The beautiful people. We learned. Um, it was dope speaking with y'all, meeting with y'all, and you know, sharing game. So today, we want to review not only some of the things that occurred at the event, but more importantly, just, you know, we like to educate and share our experience. We want to share some of the things that we did well, some of the things that you know, we could, we could change a little bit. Yeah, we could, we could change a little bit, in our dancing. opinion, right? Um, and just just make this thing bigger and better, which we have decided we are going to do something else. We don't know when, and we're going to make it bigger. We're going to make it better. But, like, here's a couple things that allowed us to do sell out an event in two weeks. Yeah, it was crazy. We sold out an event two yeah. weeks, 60 artists. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, hand clap. Yeah, That's clap it up for us. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. Right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Sold it out in two weeks. And one of the biggest reasons I can go ahead and skip ahead, Ja'Cory said, he would have liked to have more time. because It, it would have been nice. Because we could have did yeah. even more people. Yeah. But the reality is, one, the way our schedules were set up, we only had two weeks. We didn't know that it was going to be two weeks until we were having conversations. Oh, let's do an event. JR was like, yeah, we could do an event. Uh, based on my schedule, these are the dates, and then, well, yeah, it's, it's, like, like, oh, it's shit. like the only time we got is this date two weeks from now. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's try to make it happen, and we made it happen, and we appreciate y'all for helping us make that happen. And this was one of those key moments that shows many of y'all, right? I think many of y'all could like take from because this is the takeaway I have. This is one of those key moments that really reflects the idea of. Taking data, yeah, right. Having people's data and having platforms. So we've built up over time. We have what I wrote it down. All the different marketing channels that we had available to us. We had, of course, our YouTube page. Mm -hmm. Of course, the No Labels Necessary Instagram page. Mm -hmm. Guy Corey's Instagram page. Right, we're at three now. My Instagram page. Gr McKee has an Instagram page. He also has a shared information Instagram page. Mm -hmm. Now we're at six. Our email lists. Then we have Jr. emails lists. That's eight at that point. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? Uh, we didn't use text message, but we could have. That would have been nine. Um, we got the podcast platforms, like the actual audio podcast platforms. Yes, the pod, the actual audio. So, um, uh, so the podcast on the DSPs. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're at ten. And then we didn't use the Contra brand we didn't use the email contra list. Brand. We yeah. could have. So let's just say 11 in terms of what we could have had. Like 11 channels to and we get out ads. to our audience. Who? And we ran ads. And we ran ads. Yep. 12. 12, yeah. There we go. 12 ways that we could have gotten out to our audience and we used maybe nine or 10 of those ways. That's a lot of ways to be able to touch bases with your audience and why it's so important and it doesn't feel impactful while you're building it up. Right, It feels like, oh, man, I only have a couple of emails here. I only have a couple of texts there. Or I'm not selling anything right now, so why do I need this? It doesn't feel valuable. But what happens is once you're about to run an event, right? once you're about to launch something, you can get out to all the right people and be omnipresent for cheap. Mm -hmm. We didn't really spend money like that. Yeah. But our ads... Like a lot of it was more experimental than like, hey, we need to run ads. We might have sold three or four tickets off of ads and just reminding people that this thing is is happening. It's popping. Yeah, it was right? more of a brand awareness play. Brand awareness yeah. play, right? So you want to be able to sell out without having to spend money. And that's what those data sources will do for you when you collect that data. But you want to be able to spend money to just make something bigger than whatever it appears to be, right? Yeah, yeah we, we were also about about to get billboards. We thought about it. Yes. We thought about it. Yeah, I forgot about that. I'm glad you remember that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we thought about getting billboards. We we're like, oh, no, nah, we can say this. We know we, we got a lot of things that we're going to do down the line, but now we know that we can get billboards for crazy cheap. Yeah. You know, at very least, you know, spend, spend a little, we ain't going to even put the money out there, bro, because <laughs> we're going to, we, we want to use this, bro. We, we, we spend a little light work piece of change, you know, take some pictures. And then put that on the internet and let that thing live forever. Yeah. All right. Get yeah. our money's worth. 
So, but there's a lot of ways. Once you collect that data, when you start to do a tour, when you start to do special events, right? You literally can activate and launch a full blown campaign and get motion quickly. The more important part about it is how do you do that? And this is something we've done. Fortunately, we got background and event experience before we even really got hardcore into the the artists on a, on the level that we are now. So, when you start marketing your event, just like any rollout, really, you need to have variety. So we shot like 20 commercials. Yeah. We dropped maybe like five of them, all right? We could have we could have threw some more on y'all if y'all needed it, but we, we, we sold out. We good, <laughs> right? We good. We did, let me see, maybe two different types of ads, regular ads, some and some of those were commercials that weren't necessarily like, hey, b- come to this event. You need to come to this event. It was more, you know, lighthearted, skit worthy yeah. type of stuff. And the importance of that is if you push an event like with just one energy and it's always just here's the information you need to come out. It gets boring after a while. Now, we only had a short period of marketing, so we could have got away with just one type of marketing. Mm-hmm. Right. But. You know, just knowing better, we like to do better. Yeah. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Show a different side of us. It show a different side of yeah. ourselves. So when you got your first launch, you might have one piece of content and it's like, hey, this event is about to happen. Big things popping. Three days later, you can switch up your ass completely. And now, hey, you had this event that we told you about. Well, we're already selling tickets. Mm-hmm. Let people know that momentum is happening. You market the fact that success is occurring. When you sell out, oh snap, these tickets sold out. Let everybody know that this level, the gold level tickets are now sold out. All right? Why? It's two things. One, you inform your audience and market your audience that, hey, there's momentum. And if you want to be a part of this, then you need to grab one of them other ones because these are gone. And then two, you build that brand equity and let your audience know that there's people, there's other people out there that think you're worth Mm-hmm. Coming out for it. You ain't the only one, buddy. <laughs> you ain't <laughs> you are, the only one. <laughs> you are the only one. Right? So like, it's very important to market what's happening while it's happening and, and somehow integrate that. That way your message isn't one sided and bland as well. Like, oh yeah, come out to the event, it's gonna be lit. Come out to the event, it's gonna be lit. Come see me in concert. Come see me in concert. No, let people know you're selling out. Let people know what's happening. If you have multiple shows, right? Let's just say what let them know what happened at the last show. All right. Um, if you have, let's say, a special guest, right? It's just like it's the same thing festivals do. It's like, oh yeah, we're not gonna let you know everybody at all times. Sometimes we gonna hold a couple people just so we can have something else to talk about mm-hmm. later on. Or let your imagination run wild. Who, who your, might who might be popping up? Oh, they got exactly. Travis and such and such. Oh, Drake might come. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So, and that's what that's what you want to occur. And like uh, again, you only get to do that cleanly if you have people's information already. If you already have emails, if you already have text. And then, of course, you have the platforms like our YouTube and IG and all that stuff, right? But we can't guarantee that everybody's going to see that shit, Mm -hmm. right? So we'll still put that out there, but at least we know there's one place that's pretty controlled, and if we can get a 40 to 60 email open rate, that's a good amount of our audience who's seeing this, Mm -hmm. right? And once you do that, you can start to pull people into your marketing stream. And this is short. Again, this is so short, so we didn't get to activate anywhere near all the stuff we know. But owning those different channels, I know it doesn't feel like you're doing it for a reason sometimes or just like, I don't even know what to do with these emails. But once you start doing events, especially like an experience, even some kind of pro- small product launches, that's when you're going to be like, okay, this is extremely valuable, extremely valuable. Anything you wanted to add to that part? Mm, I think, you know, to add to the point about the social proofing, it's important for your audience to see other people bragging on you and your event more than you are necessarily because we kind of become, we become blind to people's, uh, I guess, um, self-belief. You know, it's like, of course you think that this event is going to be dope and is worth coming to and, you know, is worth X, Y, Z. But to your point, marketing the ticket sales and showing like, hey, we have a $15 ticket, but there are people who are willing to buy a $300 ticket, like, is, is other people basically speaking for you. So, yeah, 
I just want to overemphasize that point. Like we we believe you to some extent, especially if your audience like you know has known you for a while and trust you. Like I don't think people doubted us when we said the event was going to be cool. But then yeah, us being able to say like, hey, these high level of these tickets have sold out says a lot. Facts. You know what I'm it backs us up a lot in that. It does. It does. Which is a perfect segue into don't be greedy. Let your event sell out. Yeah. Right? Now, I know some of y'all are like, shoot, I'm just trying to get to the point where my event sells out. But allowing your event to sell out, not just taking the extra money just because it's like, oh, snap. Like, well, I could squeeze a a few more people in here. Or I only said 60 because I thought I was only going to be able to get 60. So I ain't going to hype people up. Like, But now I see more want to come. I'm going to go ahead and, like, take this extra bag. No, it's nice to actually let events sell out and want and build demand. Yeah. Right? yeah let, the, let the sting sit for the ones that didn't get yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. Because then in the future, people are going to know, oh, he can actually sell out. Mm-hmm. Right? So you just made maybe an extra, let's just say your tickets are $20. You just made an extra $100, but what you just lost in terms of that marketing equity is way more expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You want to go ahead and let that build up. So now mentally people know, oh shit, if I don't move quickly, I might miss out next time. Mm-hmm. Like that's how people felt when Beyonce went on tour. Taylor Swift went on tour. They're like, oh yeah, I know these tickets are expensive and I know these still going to sell out somehow, some way. So I got to make a decision. You want yeah. people to feel that. <laughs> right? Yeah. But you take that away if you're just going to take every bag and now your audience in some ways starts to lose trust too because they know, ah, I'll probably be able to slide in if I make a last mm-hmm. minute decision. Yeah, exactly. You don't want them to feel no kind of way like that. Yeah, they feel like they'll break you at some point. Yep. You know, and you'll just let it rock and they'll get in somehow. You like you have to stand firm on your your boundaries for your events and your offers. Like, nah, man, I said sixty people, you know, as much as I would like to have this this extra two, three hundred dollars, bro, we already at sixty, man. Exactly. You're gonna have to come to the next one when it's five hundred. Yep. And it's <laughs> on you to make sure that number that you choose can cover whatever numbers you need to cover. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, oh, well, I'll take this extra $100 because I need to be able to pay X, Y, and Z. Now, you should have did those numbers on the on front end anyway. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, let your event sell out. That equity of selling out and then coming back out again in the future and then doing well that time and continue to build off of that is so much more worth it than being able to make as much money as you can one time out. And I, I suggest... You know, choosing small venues in the beginning anyway. Like our capacity that, you know, we were at our capacity in terms of what they marketed. What well, um, When I say they, I mean the event space. They said we could only have a limited amount of people. We pretty much went with as many people as we could have. Mm-hmm. So that also made it easier to abide by, you know, our number. Yeah. Like it's not us, you know. Yeah. We got yeah. real limitations here. Real limitations <laughs> that were given to us. So, because I know it can be tempting to just say, "Ah, right, yeah, I let that other person slide." But, um, again, like, in, if you understand how to market those small wins, all right, that you sold out, all right, and then let the audience know that, that will put pay in dividends to you over and over again. Now, with that being said, <sighs> <laughs> some of the things that we could have improved. Yeah, man, because it can always be better, man. We we were shooting about about ninety eight, but not a hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. first of all, it was great. It was it was a great event, great turnout, cool people, great flow in general. So I enjoyed the event. I've had way more stressful events yeah, that I've done. Yeah, definitely. That was probably my favorite event in terms of like lack of stress. Yeah, 100%, <laughs> yeah. the most stressful thing was getting the water. <laughs> I wasn't a part of that adventure. <laughs> but speaking of, we can just go straight to that. Like, Ja'Cory feels like we should have had some snacks. We should have had snacks, bro. I mean, I mean, in our defense, we only planned for like three, four. You know, those that don't know, the event went over a little bit. Um, so I can understand why we didn't think we need snacks. But looking back on it, man, some chips, some water, you know what I'm saying? some fruit snacks. What I will say <laughs> is food is something that, will always improve an experience. Yeah, 100%. Now, we're talking about, in this case, like snacks, snacks, yeah, like food and chips and some fucking nuts and stuff or something. Yeah. But, <laughs> like, if you want to for real bring food into your experience, 
then you can charge more for that too. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. you can make more just by selling that on the side, whichever way you put it in the package, or you have some tickets that come with it and some that don't. Like, there's plenty of ways to flip that. But um, I've heard many people complain about like big concerts. Apparently, for some reason, aren't having like yes, uh, like vending machine, uh, not vending machines. They aren't the food vending, vendors. yeah, food yeah. vendors. They don't and all stuff have like food that. vendors, but and then I mean, even some of the bigger festivals like lack on it, like. I don't know. They could have changed since the last one I've been to, but like Rolling Loud is very notorious for having terrible food. At it. It's just like the absolute bare minimum. But Man. you know, they're like, "Hey, you came here to get drunk and see Travis Scott." You know what I'm saying? You'll, you'll be <laughs> all right. <laughs> like, but yeah, there are, there are a couple of like bigger concerts that won't even have. You know, sometimes they have like the concession stand with like hot dogs. And yeah, popcorn like, that's what I was. Yeah, some of them won't even do that. Won't even do that. Crazy. It's like, yo. That's it's an easy eight dollars you could have got for me for that hot dog, bro. The right day, I remember going to Kanye's concert and paying like eleven dollars for a hot dog, and I was like, "Where else I'm gonna go? Where I'm gonna go get <laughs> where I'm gonna go get some food." Got bro. you on an island, man. <laughs> I realized that my first time at a festival, and oh, well, my first time at like a festival, like where I was in the middle of a nowhere festival, and because I, I was working it, but I saw literally all of the economics at work. Now you get people in this to this different world. They're on an island and now they're gonna make different decisions. Yeah, bro. It's like, you're, dang, you're how hot, much? you drunk, yep. you're disoriented, hungry, <laughs> thirsty. Yeah, man, you don't make the smartest decisions under those conditions. Yeah. That's how you get finesse into buying an $11 hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> that might be a whole nother <laughs> conversation. But yeah, the, the economics and the craziness I saw in that event and the, was was beautiful. It yeah. was a true, it was a true social experiment similar to the Firefest type of thing. Mm. That was my very yeah. first, which is why, like, when people be talking about festival, I just see it completely different. Because my first shit was like some shit like that, but I was working at least, so it was a different experience than the people who were really going through it. I was working on a food truck, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna get into that. But also the production quality. Well, actually, before we get into away from food too, you know, we talked about the bundle. Oh uh, yeah, the merch bundle. Yeah, the merch. Right, we had merch. Right now, we could have done better with merch if we knew people's sizes. We didn't know y'all were some big boys. There's a lot of y'all yeah. like dudes out there. A lot of six four two eighty. We needed more. <laughs> we needed more XLs. We needed more XLs. Unfortunately, and we didn't have as much XLs. So we would probably would have did a survey, or at least now we know for the future in terms of sizing. It was done in a very short period of time, as we said. Right. Yeah. So even all the stuff that we know to do, we weren't able to do. Yeah. Um. But yeah, you, you you talked about having the bundle, you know. Oh uh, yeah, it, well, tying into the food, I I think we could have gotten away with selling juice for like three to five dollars. We were selling the hoodies for sixty five, and I think that we could have had a bundle where if you bought a hoodie, you would get a juice for free. Because I'm thinking, if I want a hoodie <laughs> and I'm thirsty, like I'm already thinking about getting both. Right now, it feels like a finesse to just buy the hoodie anyway mm. and get the juice for free. That's how I was you saying. always want, <laughs> not always, but you it, you definitely can always always benefit when the audience feels like they're the ones finessing. Yeah, exactly. For yeah, sure. yeah. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with you thinking you got got over on me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I say, but why why not go hardcore with it, man? You had these juices, man. You know, let people be thirsty, and say you can't get a juice until you buy a hoodie. Mm. <laughs> That's almost Machiavellian, man. Like, I don't know. Yeah, just have him sitting there looking good, <laughs> frosty and ice. The condensation <laughs> dripping down on the side, because it was kind of hot in there. I ain't gonna lie. It, that would have um, got me. Yeah, hey, man, I'm just saying. I'm like, man, I got, I got 65 on me, man. 65? All right, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that festival that I said, I know that shit like that could work. But again, we're gonna, that <laughs> is a whole other conversation. Let's talk about the fact that most artists fail to understand that it doesn't take forever to monetize your audience. We had an artist literally begin to take off and make $20,000 from his brand new audience in the same month. But how is that possible? It's because we're in a new era, baby. Yes, you want to continue to build a relationship over time, but the first time you make money from your audience can happen today if you understand the new age music marketing funnel for artists. So if you want to hear about this approach and how you can apply it to yourself, I made a completely free video to watch at www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash monetize. You got to make sure you put the www or if you're on YouTube, you can find the link in the description and check out how we help monetize artists for completely free. I 
promise it'll completely change how you see things. Another thing is production <laughs> quality. We had um, a last minute decision where we realized we didn't have a, a what do you call it, moderator. When yeah. We were asking questions to the crowd with the crowd. So Lima, appreciate you, Lima. See, yeah. you remember? Yeah, you remember? Lima, right, Lima yeah. hopped up, was able to pass in the mic around until everybody decided we just gonna pass the, the mic to the next man themselves. What we could have done better was had like some type of mic for the crowd, specific yeah, like, to the like crowd. Step up to or something. Yeah. Well, well, the step up, yes. And then this is the thing that I always think about. That doesn't translate necessarily to our event, but like when I was doing um events for my 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 homies and shit like that, when we were going out to like Augusta and stuff and doing these these events, stuff like like using the crowd to like create an artificial environment and then also capturing that as much as possible. Like I was big on having people in the crowd. Like y'all was like y'all got all your homies on stage being hype, man. No, put them in the crowd and then make them hype so they can be infectious for the rest of the crowd. Mm -hmm. And at least the footage will also look like you got somebody just in case the crowd isn't lit for mm -hmm. you because you knew, right? But then also like having like a boom mic or something crazy like hanging over the crowd so you capture that audio different. When you get into the post production, that's gonna be crazy footage. Like having that audio at that quality and then also obviously having a camera face that and, and capture that. Like people really underestimate the value of capturing content in a non-basic way mm -hmm. and how that influences your future shows. Yep. Cause you're showing people what your show looks like. You could every always tell somebody something's gonna be lit. But when they see it mm -hmm. being lit and interesting, then it just becomes so much easier. Yeah, exactly. Right? Cause we're looking at this footage and imagining what it would be like to be there. So I can either imagine myself in a fun situation, having fun, enjoying myself, where I can imagine myself in a miserable situation where the crowd isn't doing anything, I'm hot. Yep. You're always hot either way, you know? So it's exactly. either I'm hot and having fun or I'm hot and bored. Exactly. You know? So yeah, no, I agree with that. And something that I've done before that we didn't do here, and again, it translates even better for like an artist event or a festival or something. Um, but like having everybody do stories and then capturing their stories. Like one of the best times I did it, you have people from their perspective, different parts of the building, different parts of whatever they find to be interesting, like legitimately, and they would be tagging the festival. And I did this huge montage of all of these different stories, and but it was edited too, though. It wasn't just like, oh, you're watching the story. So all the boring stuff was cut out. And what it ends up feeling like is like first person mode. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're having these real life perspectives, and you mesh that in with your high quality, cool camera footage that you capture yourself. But something feels a little bit more raw and real about the first person. Mm -hmm. So you can show people the hey, this is gonna the glossy, this is gonna be really cool, this is gonna be the vibe, and I want to attract you there. But then also giving them that first person mode is like, oh shoot, it really is like that, mm -hmm. right? It feels a lot more organic, natural, and it's and it's a stronger word of mouth or has a stronger credibility than even your marketing that you do with your high glossy video, yeah. your corporate style video. Yeah, because that goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like People expect you to frame your event the best way possible and to have nothing but good things to say about it. But yep. we know that the people there are going to give their real, raw, unfiltered either opinion or look take on the event, which, yeah, we do trust a lot more. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And it was one other thing in that category that I forgot too. I mean, um, I didn't think about this earlier. But kind of them thinking about the event posting stuff. I, we we probably should have had like a an event hashtag or something. You know what I'm saying for everybody to like post yeah. to, to have a collection of our own. Yep. Social proofing. Yeah, we didn't think about that. Yeah. Like, like that stuff is like it's not about the event going viral. It's literally just to make it easier for yourself to have more content stuff yeah, like that. Exactly. Like yeah. a little pool for you to sift through out there. Like oh, okay, yeah, this is a good video. This is a good yep. picture. Yeah. This guy has some, a great caption. You know, <laughs> some great things to say. Yeah, and, and and I think I didn't understand that bit that the value of that like when I first started doing things like this because at first you just like you're thinking more about virality you're thinking more mm -hmm. about you know just stuff like that like because you're just worried about selling out the doors and stuff mm -hmm. but once you get into the post content and the future marketing bag that it could be out of twenty videos having one video 
that's really valuable of somebody capturing something right of you saying something perfect or it's like oh wait they took a picture with their homies and they look like they're having a great time like so now i can use that in my future marketing because mm-hmm. i might have missed all that myself like there's always something when other, the other people are, are just catch catching whatever they catch that yeah. you can use as valuable yeah and that was a great bigger point like the it's, it's very easy to fall into thinking mainly about the pre-event marketing because you're right, you're focused on selling tickets out that sometimes you don't mm-hmm. save enough energy or reserve for the post-event marketing. We know, like, thankfully for us, we have a podcast that we do, you know, two, two times a week. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we have lots of avenues to do at least a little bit of uh, post-event marketing. We got mm-hmm. other plans for, you know, things that y'all going to start seeing pretty soon, including this episode. But, Mm -hmm. you know, it is very easy to think about it where you're like, damn, I spent so much energy and resources and sometimes even my budget to get motherfuckers there that I didn't think about all the things I needed to do to keep the momentum of the event going once it's over, which is also important, right? You got that two weeks leading up to the event and then you have arguably that two or three weeks after the event where you need to be probably just as intense. Well, yeah. Yes, you do. Yeah, you need to be just as intense about it both ways. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um... Like, that's something we talked about the first time we recorded it. So we re-recording, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> a little, little thing happened. But it's only take two this time, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you yeah, know, yes. only take two. But <laughs> you basically mentally need to be prepared to not look at the day of the event as the end date of the event. At least one week out, at least, like Ja'Cory said, could be even three because you need to do post-release marketing. So you instantly go into, yo, like, here's the event. Things are being set off. We need to capture this event and we need to quickly push out content. What content can go out quickly? What content is going to take a little bit more post-production so we can really sum things up? And it's not until all of that is complete that we are done with this event, right? Mm -hmm. If people got to be paid in some cases, depending on what kind of event you're throwing on, like how does all that get done? When does it get done? But you're not done until that's done. And I, Mm -hmm. I remember mentioning that, like for instance, even the videographers, right? It's like, all right, bro, right when this is over, I need all y'all to put this oh, in the yeah. cloud, you know, put this on the drive. Name and tag everything. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we can't have this stuff missed. We need this stuff organized. That needs to be ASAP. So if you're hiring somebody or if you have somebody internal, I, of course, prefer if you have somebody internal, but whatever that agreement is needs to include, hey, the shooting and then uploading of the raw footage damn near immediately, mm-hmm. all right? And it's like, all right, yeah, you can do whatever you need to do if you want to, like, color correct and all that kind of stuff, but at least get this raw footage up there so we have it. And then it's also not just you, primary videographer. We might have some other people who might want to tweak some things and do mm-hmm. other videos and have other visions. So you don't have to wait for the, just that one person. And speaking of videographer, Sharante could have did better at capturing the stories. <laughs> <laughs> I told this man to capture the stories, but we didn't plan this out. It was in the moment, and he was and he was doing a lot. We had one man doing a, doing many things. But when I say capture the story, something we could have planned better is we had people. Uh, shout out Adam drove from Chicago like the night before. Uh, we had people oh, coming Adam. from L.A. We had people coming from all different types of places, and we should have captured those stories, like the journey. Of and, and it's nice that we call a couple people like just saying where they're from or came from, but it's different to just say where you're from and say, oh yeah, I drove here last night. I stayed in a motel or da 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 da. Right? That's crazy. What did that journey look like? And we should have captured that, not necessarily even just for the post event here, but a year from now when we're really compiling the story and everything that we're doing because we got some really dope shit coming. We could have really laid that out. So, you know, even yeah, man. What, what if that man going to be the next Drake, bro? We ain't never gonna have that proof that he he said he did that. Uh, so yeah, like little little things like that, and I think artists don't do that enough. Actually, the the fan testimonial version of things, like mm-hmm. business events, do that very well. Mm-hmm. Um, but artists can like ask people about their experience how was it and it doesn't mean you have to use it or all of it the whole point not the whole point but one of the biggest principles in like content is get more content than you need yeah right yep so you have it not need it 
You never know yeah. exactly what story you're going to need to tell or what you're going to need to emphasize. So to have other people just these different versions of success indicators, oh, I see a crowd. Oh, I saw that a show happened. Oh, I see this individual person. I see this person that looks like this. It's a man, it's a woman. It's a whatever race, right? Because depending on whatever brand you you want to show, who you're leaning towards. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, man, I might need to you know, um, convince this corporation who I need to look a little safer to, uh, yeah. you know, to, <laughs> to give me these money, this money. So I might have to put in my safer fans in this video, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. like you never know what you're going to need to accomplish. So like capturing the content when you have that moment and that's the huge thing about events. It's about that moment. You have to do it because you can't just like post another video tomorrow. Like you do with social media. It's, mm -hmm. Oh, I got to get your Corey while he's here. This person while he's here. Uh, while it's happening. So it's one of those things that you need to plan ahead, orchestrate, uh, choreograph, and um, like really have a full checklist of every different type of content that you need, which we could do a whole nother video on that sometime. Yeah, and I think too it speaks to the point where I think with most artists and just people who throw events in general, you tend to think that your experience and story regarding putting the event together is the more important thing when in reality it's the story and experience of the people who are involved in the event, right? Like the, the yes. attendees. Cause yes. like from our perspective, it's like, you know, yep. artists love to put that there like, man, I have to fight the label for weeks to be able to get the budget to, to make this. And I flew all the way out here from, you know what I'm saying, Miami. And we like, well, you're the one that wanted to put the event together. So I expected you to, to do whatever you had to do to mm -hmm. make it, to make it happen. I'm yep. not really, yeah, it's impressive to some degree depending on what you had to do, but like, once again, it's your event. You 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 put this together and put made this date. So mm -hmm. I expect you to make it happen. But me, me that had to fight through my life struggles and whatever it took for me to get to this event, which is going to resonate with more people who are watching, to your point, the, the post event content and marketing, like they're they're gonna resonate with the the attendee, you know what I'm saying, not the person that put it together. Yep. Way more. You know, show so, me what it feels like to support you. Exactly. Yep. 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 Yeah. That's a real good one. I hope y'all don't miss that one. Uh, show people their experience because that's what you're marketing, all right? Not your experience. You you, sh you show your journey to connect them to you, but you show them their potential journey in support of you to attract them and make them want to be involved. Um, the only other thing that I can think of, which is something we kind of did, we could have streamlined even more so, but artists definitely should do this, is always go in knowing what story you want to tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like every city you go to, every type of event, there's some story that you can tell. And there might be new subplots that pop up, right? Stories that you didn't expect to come from this event. But at least have one specific story that you want to tell. So then as you go throughout the night, you're capturing footage and things that associate with that particular story. And when you're done, you at least got one clean video that can come out of it. Mm -hmm. That's like quality and beyond just, oh, let me just put some random footage together. And, um, you know, like it, it, it comes out looking like another basic concert or a basic event. Mm -hmm. All right. That's the difference. Those videos that really stick out and they drive people, they make people wish they were there are the ones that like tell a stronger story. And that doesn't mean like a documentary uh, maybe we need to do a whole nother video on that. Ask, you know, drop a comment if y'all want to hear more on that. But like, just just make it clear. Like, um, like ha come out with something specific. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. At least you, you know, if no matter how it goes, you got something to work and build on. And that's the the biggest thing here, man. Events are so random. We're like, yeah, you can only plan so much. Something's gonna go wrong. Somebody's gonna say or do something you didn't expect. You might say or do something you didn't expect, but if you can leave out of it, knowing that no matter what, I have this very strong narrative and thing to push, yep. and I hit the capacity of the event that I wanted to hit, then in, in our eyes, you had a successful event. You know, Everything else is just icing on the cake to That's that it. point. Yeah. That's it. Well, shoot. That is our experience at 90 Day Blueprint Live, our first event. We're going to do some more in different ways. They all are gonna be exactly that type of event, but maybe we do that one again. 
Let us know what y'all think about this video. We're going to do some more. Like, we, we really know this event shit. So we're going to give y'all some, like, sauce sauce. This is just our experience doing it fast. And I feel like this is the closest we're going to get to how some of these artists are. Uh, yeah, bro. The like, tour coming, bro. Yeah. The tour coming, yeah, man. Y'all yeah, yeah. got to let us know where y'all want us to come to. Because I got a lot of people saying, like, oh, you got to do this in, like, Houston or do this in D.C. or something. You know? Hey, bro. Anybody in Martha's Vineyard area? You know Martha's what I mean? Vineyard? <laughs> Anybody in a, live in a vacation spot? Yeah, take, <laughs> give me bring, take me somewhere out, man. Take me somewhere sweet that I can uh, bring my girl with me and get props for it. I mean, the next one's gonna be in Boston or some shit. Ah, uh, I you know what. <laughs> this is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary. I'm Brad and Sean, and I'm Corey, and we out. Peace. Appreciate you for watching. If you like content like this, you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com. And the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. We get straight to the information. There's play by play and courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members, and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.